Uh, oh, blessed Father, thank you, Lord, um, that we have been able to gather together tonight. And Lord, our hearts m might be heavy because of the things going around, Lord, but we are also under the the events understanding, Lord, that your time clock is moving quickly and that you are in control. And that's the only thing we really are, uh, we're hanging our hat on, Lord. It gives us great hope that even when things look amiss, you are in complete control. Colossians tells us that you are the preeminence, that all things consist in your hands. And so, Father, as we talk about going into Romans here, as we talk about mindset, as we talk about faith, as we talk about tribulations and why they're important, as we talk about your son and what he did for us to set us free, Lord, let our hearts and minds be fixed on the story, the story that is most important, that you sent your son and he died for us, that we would have eternal life. We're grateful for the gospel, Lord. Father, go before us, open our hearts to <clears throat> whatever it is that you wish for us to hear and what's important. Bless us and keep us, Father, and go before us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been in Romans, but interestingly, the Bible sometimes catches me off guard. And I was just doing my general reading yesterday, and I was in Colossians. And just as a side note, really not part of my uh, teaching here, but it was something that really caught my eye. And I was writing it, I was reading it in the in the English Standard Version. Mm. Now I have the New King James here, but what caught my eye was a colon. And it was interesting. Why is it that when we're reading through the Bible, we could read over it and read over it and read over it, we pass it by, and then all of a sudden, God stops you and says, look at this. And this is what I saw. In the New King James, it's in Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. It says that, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, colon. And in the colon in the ESV, it was this colon. To, to walk pleasing to him means do the next two things. That's what it says. That's how it denotes that. It says, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Being fruitful in every good work and walking in the knowledge and increasing the knowledge of God. That's simply loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself. Walked in here, Paul telling the church to Colossae, that all you got to do is love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself to seek to be fruitful and know God a deeper way. And that's what my heart is for this ministry is to know God deeper and to show you God deeper in these, in, as I bring it to you in these studies and to, and to walk in fruit, to, to bear fruit in your lives in a way that I can help you in any way I can. That's my heart here. That is the truth of a shepherd, a shepherd's heart. And I so ask the Lord all the time to, to enlarge my shepherd's heart. But now we go to Habakkuk. This is a, quite the turn. Because what are we watching happening in our day? We're watching all kinds of crazy, crazy things, and nobody expected a war in Israel that happened so quickly on Sunday. But we've been through Habakkuk before, and look, Habakkuk's in the same situation. Look what it says, chapter 1, verse 2. Oh Lord, how long shall I cry, and you will not hear, even cry out to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to be, see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous and therefore perverse judgment proceeds. Habakkuk says, there's a whole bunch of horrible stuff happening around here in Israel. Why aren't you doing anything about it, God? 
There's violence. There's justice. The, the courts are jacked up. Everybody's lawless. All these things are happening. And you're supposed to be taking care of us, Father. Why aren't you doing so? And verse 5 says, is God's reply. Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told to you. For indeed, I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and nasty nation. And you've read the story. You've read the book. Habakkuk says, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. That's not what I meant. You, we need you to come in and stop the problem, not send a horrible people in here to judge us. And God says, well, who do you think you are? You think you're so much better than anybody else. I'm in complete control of everything. We see that in chapter 2, verse 2. <clears throat> the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. God says, I got something for you. Write it down. Write it down so we can plainly understood. So those who can understand will put it into practice. That's what it says in verse 2. Verse 3 says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come and it will not tarry. Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. God says, The prideful will be handled. Everyone will be judged. Everyone will get what's coming to them. By the way, write this all down. We don't know what this vision is. This vision could be Babylon. This vision could be Rome. This vision could be the seven-year tribulation. It doesn't say. And all of them came to be. All of them brought judgment and, 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 a, and an exodus of biblical proportions against the people who didn't do what God said to do. In their, in their wickedness, if you read chapter 1, you see what Israel's doing by violence and by corruption and by lies and deception. Just like today, Israel is no different now than it was back then. They're in the land and they own the land. It's God's land, but they're in there in unbelief. They don't even believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And somewhere along the line, God needs to justify his judgment against them. It's called the seven-year tribulation. But realize that those who believe in those who believe in God, the just shall live by faith. If you're justified by faith, you live. That's what we're going to talk about today in Romans. That the what does it mean to be justified by faith? What does God mean in this day when we stand here when judgment is coming and things are coming to come against us? <clears throat> One of my favorite illustrations in the Bible of, of the of the gospel picture, a picture of the gospel in the Old Testament is in Jeremiah chapter 21. This is the coolest picture of, of what the gospel really needs to be in your heart because all the pieces are here. This is what it says in Jeremiah 21, 8 to 10. It says, now you shall say to this people, thus says the Lord, behold, I set before you the way of life in the way of death. He who remains in this city shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. <clears throat> but he who goes out and defects to the Chaldeans who besiege you, he shall live, and his life shall be a prize to him. For I have set my face against this city for the adversity and not for good, says the Lord. It shall be given into the hand of the king of Babylon and he shall burn it with fire. Do you see the picture? Jeremiah, through God, God says, look, I'm going to give you a choice. You can live or you can die. If you stay in this city, that is the world, if you stay in this city, you will die by pestilence or famine or sword. That sounds like the four horsemen. Judgment's coming. But if you... Listen to my voice and you walk out of this city and give yourself up to the Chaldeans. You'll live. You'll be taken to another place. But you will win your life as a prize. Jesus is just the Chaldeans in the gospel. 
leave the city of this world and do what God said. Give yourself up. Give yourself over. Humbly give your life to Jesus and let him take you to heaven for a new place. That's the life or death decision that we here now have to make because Jesus is life. If you choose not to accept that free gift, you only have death in the seven-year tribulation. The just shall live by faith. Those who are justified will live by faith. Look at Romans chapter 4. We read chapter 4 last time, but I want to get a running head start because what we're talking about is faith. Romans chapter 4, verse 20, talking about Abraham's faith. Abraham did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform, and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. <clears throat> God made him a promise. God said, you're going to be the father of, many, of, a, of a nation. That nation will become many nations. And you will bring from your nation a blessing to the whole world that we would find out later. That's the Messiah. But Abraham was quite a bit older and shouldn't be having kids. And all of a sudden, he's believing something that seems to be impossible. How can he and Sarah have a kid to further a nation? But God said so. And he believed God. And God took that belief and accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham didn't do anything. Abraham simply believed that what God said would be true. And you see a number of places in Abraham's life where he believed, even to take Isaac up to sacrifice him on Mount Moriah. If you read in Hebrews, he said he, said he believed that even if he had to sacrifice Isaac, God would bring him back to life. Because he believed so wholeheartedly in the promise that God had given him that he was going to be the father of a nation that he didn't waver. Now that's, it. that's all fine and dandy for Abraham. We're not Abraham. But look what it says in verse 23. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered up because of the offenses and was raised because of our justifications. Abraham was justified by faith, and so are we. Now, Abraham was justified by believing that God was going to make him a nation. We're justified by believing that God sent his only son to die for us so that we would have eternal life. There's no difference in the faith. We can't work for it. We can't do anything for it. We have, been, we have been brought back and reconciled to God because Jesus bled to wipe out our sins. Our ledger is clear. We are at the level we need to be. Do you, do you realize that if you truly accepted Jesus Christ by faith, you are already living your eternal life? You're already in eternity. Because we're not, we're not residents of earth. We're residents of heaven. We're just hanging out on earth until he either comes and gets us or we die naturally here. But we'll never die. Jesus said, those who believe in me will never die. What a cool promise. That's a promise we can only take by faith. So with that, look at chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore... We love the word therefore. It's a transition word, right? We want to know why it's there. What is it there for? Because we are given this faith, imputed faith by God, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Peace with God. Now, Adam and Eve had peace with God. They hung out with him in the garden until Adam and Eve made a mistake, and they blew up the one rule they had. 
And then they were at enmity with God. They had, there was a chasm between God and man because God is just and a sinful man cannot do anything about it. But we see there in chapter 3 of Genesis a promise God makes to the serpent that he will show, he will make right this problem. That, that's what we have. We haven't been at peace until Jesus. When Jesus died, we were made at peace again if you accept Christ as your Savior. He gives us this access to this faith. We, we stand in grace given to us through Jesus Christ. Now, why I bring this up, this peace with God issue up, is because we are at peace with God, being believers in Christ. We are reconciled and we are at a level where God can then convene with us again. We have eternal life. God is not an enemy to us. Why this is important is because when we start to see tribulations happen against us, if we're not careful and we don't realize that God is at peace with us, we may start to have the wrong idea. We may start to fail at believing that God's at war with us or that he's forgotten about us. He's turned away or that he's punishing us when that's not true. See, tribulation is good. God uses it. It says so in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. We know that all things work together for good of those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Well, you're not called unless you're saved. If you're saved and you love God, then your life is given over to him, a bondservant, a doulos, we like to use that word. And now we stand in a place where we're at peace with God. So everything that happens to you has a good outcome, regardless of how bad it is. This is a paradigm we need to understand because we're about to walk into a time period when it could get really hard. But we are at peace with God. And so everything that God allows to happen to us will be beneficial in the end. It won't feel like it. It doesn't feel like it. The things that I'm dealing with now don't feel good. But I have to realize that God's got my best interest in mind. They're for our good and God's glory. And we know that all things work together for those who love him. That's why chapter number three, uh, verse three says, and not only that, but we also glory in, tribula glory in tribulations. How are we supposed to glory in tribulations? Knowing this, this is a hard pill to swallow, but look what it does. Glory in, glorying in tribulation, that tribulation produces perseverance. Well, that's a positive. Oh, and perseverance, character. Oh, that's a positive. And character, hope. That's a positive. And now hope doesn't disappoint. That's positive. Uh, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. We'll get to that in a minute. That's amazing. But I want to point out five words in this list because we need to understand what they are so that I can show you that tribulations still do good things for us as we are living in a time when tribulation is going to expend. I want to tell you about glory and tribulation and perseverance and character and hope. Okay, the first word glory there, that just simply means to boast. How do you boast about tribulation? Hard stuff, difficulties, heavy pressures. How are we supposed to boast about that? God says we can boast about that. Tribulation, Think. Of, I want you to remember these words because we're going to see them over and over and over again throughout this whole Bible study. It's really amazing. The word tribulation is the Greek word thlipsis, T-H-L-I-P-S-I-S, -I -I, uh, thlipsis. It's a pressing pressure, a very heavy pressure, as if you were being squeezed. It came from the, the word phlebo, which is a compressed path, or a pressing as if you were to press grapes, a pressure. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 through 9, Paul is talking about a, a hard pressure, a thlipsis. He says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, 
that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed, flipses. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. I love this this series of verses because it says we are we have this treasure in earthen earthen vessels in other versions it's jars of clay you know that our body is made of the elements we find in the clay we pull that out of genesis chapter 1 we're a we're a pot we're a vessel and god's power is inside the vessel now pressure a pressing pressure would crush that vessel Except that God's power is glory that's inside pushes against the pressure. So we're not crushed. We're pressed. But the internal power of Christ within us keeps us from folding, from being crushed by the weight. So we're hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. Yeah, we're perplexed, but not in despair. He he continues to say, yep, it's bad, but it's not as bad as it could be. That's the tribulation. And we're supposed to glory in that. I'm not sure how to do that, but the Bible tells us as we continue. When we glory and deal with and work through flipsis, pressure, hardships, difficulties, tribulations, makes us, gives us perseverance. That word, you've heard it around here, this church is called hupomone. You've heard that number around. You've heard that word around here. It's a cheerful or hopeful endurance. It's an enduring patience, a steadfastness in difficulty. We walk steadfastly with a patient endurance as things are coming, knowing that God's working, knowing God's bringing this pressure. It gives us this long-term, long-suffering to be able to put up with it. Now, that's not easy. That's a hard thing to do. It's endurance with hope, knowing that to have endurance to deal with something, but knowing God's in control gives us a positive influence in building perseverance in hard times. James 1, 2 to 4 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Hupomone. But let patience, hupomone, have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You would, you would be mature. Well, that takes us to the next one. If you have perseverance, perseverance over time gives us character. If you're reading the King James Version, it's experience. It gives us experience. Well, that makes sense. The longer you're in a job, the longer you're dealing with something, you gain experience. You know how to do it better. You know how to do it more efficiently. You can do the job in a way that is better than somebody who just walked in to do it. That word is dokime. Dokime, it means experience. It means to, it's a proven trustworthiness in trials. The longer you deal with trials, the longer you have perseverance, the longer that you deal with these pressing pressures and you understand that you can do it because God is with you, gives you a trustworthiness over time. It builds character. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 9 says this. And actually, I'm going to start in verse 6. It says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if you need be, you have been grieved by various trials. That the genuineness of your faith, dokime, character, your character, your experience is, is manifested in a genuineness of your faith. Your faith becomes genuine, powerful, steadfast, and understanding. How amazing! That if you're grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. And though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unexpensable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, 
the salvation of your souls. Realize that faith is, is, is things hoped for, right? It's the evidence of things not seen. We see that in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. But at this point, this takes you to the end of your faith. What does that mean? That means you're standing before Jesus Christ and you don't need faith because you see him. He's there. He's holding you there, holding you in the right place. The salvation of your souls is the end of our faith. The rapture of the church or when you stand before him after death on this earth. And it brings us to the last word that's in there. It says, and perseverance becomes character and character becomes hope. Hope is the word el peace, E-L-P-I-S. A quiet, confident expectation in Christ and what is going to happen. Romans chapter 8, verse 24 and 25 says, For we are saved for this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? I don't need to hope in Jesus Christ if he's standing in front of me. He's there. I'm built in this hope. This hope is something I'm waiting. Blessed, It's the blessed hope in Titus chapter 2, verse 13. But I don't have to hope for him anymore. I don't have to have faith in Jesus anymore when I see him because I know he's real. I'm standing before him. I'm looking for, forward to hearing his voice. And as I've said on a number of occasions on this, I like that ver- the, the verse in 1 John chapter 2, the end of chapter 2 that says, just make sure I'll read it because this is, this. it just sticks to me. It sticks with me all the time. It's in 1 John chapter 2 verse 28 it says and now little children abide in him that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him that is coming we need to live a life in hope we need to live a life of character we need to live a life that gives us this this understanding of what's coming so that we persevere in our life. We, we work through perseverance waiting for his coming and that what we're doing and saying and thinking and how we're acting, how we're doing, right? We want to be fruitful in the things that we do and be getting deeper into the knowledge of God, those things that please God in Colossians chapter one, like I started with, when we're doing that, we won't be ashamed when Jesus stands before us because there's a one-on-one conversation with him coming. We see that in Revelation. But do you see why this is important to be at peace with God? Because if you're at enmity, none of this makes sense. Now all of a sudden you're being attacked and you're at war and he's, he, he, maybe he's turned his, he's gone. I don't hear him. He's not gone. He's not. He's the promises of God are here. When we live at peace with God, all that stuff that happens to us has a value to it. Look at the condition of man in the world. Look at the condition of the things that are happening even in the Middle East right now, or even Ukraine, or in Africa. The Bible tells us in chapter 24 of Matthew that 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 there's going to be kingdom against kingdom and nation against nation, trials and troubles and earthquakes. You realize there was 600 some earthquakes that happened on the day Israel was invaded. 629. All across the world, six of them were over 6.0. And one in, the one in Afghanistan killed 2,000 people. That didn't make the media because there's a war in Israel. But the world is upset. God is upset. Was that judgment? Boy, I don't know. But the Bible says that in the end days, all this stuff is going to start happening. And we're seeing it, seeing it happening. We need to be on our horse and be ready. Understand, and I, and I, and I continue to kind of harp on this, we need to know what we believe why we believe it, what we're willing to do in the name of Jesus Christ, because I don't know what's coming. If they're going to turn on the Jewish people, they'll turn on the Christians next, because we're both God's people. Just read through Romans 9, 10, and 11 to understand who we are grafted together, a group. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that too, or chapter 3. So as we continue, look at verse 5 again really quick. It says, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts. Do you realize that? 
God's love poured into our hearts. We didn't work for it. We didn't earn it. We didn't do anything about it. He poured it in our heart by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. That's what it says. The Holy Spirit was given to you and me. How cool is that? We didn't earn it. Didn't go off in the confessional. I didn't get drips on my head when I was a baby. I wasn't, can't get it by baptism, can't get it by circumcision, can't get it by going into a confessional booth and telling a man on the other side of the screen that I'd done something wrong. It's given to me by faith. The Holy Spirit, a gift. Why? Why do you think God did that? Why did Jesus give us the helper? Matthew chapter 26, verse 40 and 41 says, well, then he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, what could you, you couldn't watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus knew that our body was, we couldn't do it on our own. The spirit wants to do what we want to do, but our flesh can't. And at this point, Jesus is alive. The helper hadn't been sent. But look what it says in John chapter 16, verse 12 to 14. It says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Jesus knew that the Holy Spirit would bring us a power we don't have, a strength. Well, what does that mean? Well, he gave it, he gave it to us. He poured out God's love into our house, into our heart by the Holy Spirit. It was given to us. Look at verse six. For when we were still without strength in due season and due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He knew we couldn't do it on our own. He knew that without the spirit, we couldn't battle the flesh. Paul talks about it in other letters, that the spirit deals with the flesh and the flesh deals with the spirit. It's a battle we're always going to be fighting. Temptations to do other things besides seek God. Beside to be fruitful in the things that I'm doing and to deepen my knowledge of God. The things that I told you bring God happiness. He knew he couldn't do it alone. He knew he needed to send the, and we were enemies at this time. We didn't have strength. We were still sinners so far away from God. And yet he came to us even when we were enemies, when we were at distance from him to pull us close by giving us the Holy Spirit, by pouring him into our hearts. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. God knew that his grace, what he gave you, his unmerited favor, whatever he has put you in, given to you in your life with the Holy Spirit, because the love of God is poured out in your hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given to you, that that's all you needed. My strength is made perfect in your weakness because God knows that he's the one you need to be leaning on. How do you further yourself in that place? <clears throat> Psalm 28, verse 6 to 9 says, Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplications. This is David speaking. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices. And with my song, I will praise him. Listen to verse eight. The Lord is their strength. And he is the saving refuge of his anointed. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Shepherd them also and bear them up forever. David says, God's my strength. And David says, God's your strength, Israel's strength, 
the church's strength. And God has promised to bear us up forever. He is the one we have to lean on. He is the one we should be seeking. He is the one that cannot be thwarted in the midst of difficult times. See, understand why it's important to be peace with God. Because when in your mind you know that God is at peace with you, that all this stuff that's happening isn't against you, isn't it because he's punishing you, isn't it coming? No, he's just making you more like Jesus. Jesus suffered, so will we. Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Yep, so were we. Jesus will live forever for eternity. Yep, so will we. The Bible says we're heirs and co-heirs with Christ into the kingdom of God. We're living eternity now, no matter what happens. Don't worry worry about those people that can kill the body but can't touch your soul. Worry about the one that can kill your body and your soul by sending it into hell. This is a mentality we need to be sitting on because right now the power that God's word has in us should be paramount. It should be at the center of all things, preeminence to everything. All right, check this out. Look look at verse nine. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we're justified by faith through the blood of Jesus Christ. That blood has washed our sins away. We know this through the gospel message. We shall be saved from wrath through him. Oh, well, it's a prophetic, it's a prophetic verse. Hmm. If we're justified by God's blood, by Jesus's blood, then we're, we're sealed by the spirit that was poured out into our hearts because that was given to us and we're justified by faith and we will not see wrath of God. We won't be judged. Because we've been already been judged. Our, our sins were judged through Jesus. Jesus took our judgment on the cross. So just like it's in the court system here, you can't be tried for the same crime twice. It's called double jeopardy. You can't be. The Constitution tells us we can't do that. We can't do that here either. Jesus said those, those sins... Even the sins we're about to, we're going to commit up into the point where we stand before the Lord are done. They're paid for. They've already been handled. The wrath of God is taking care of it by putting it on his son. He's the propitiation, really fancy Bible, ver- Bible word. He's the replacement. He's the appeasement of our sins. So it says here we're going to miss wrath. Why is that important? Because the seven-year tribulation is seven years of wrath which means it's a pre-tribulation rapture. We're not going to go there. We're going to miss it because God won't allow us to see wrath again because Jesus took it the first time. I like Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. It says, because you have kept my command to persevere. Oh, that's hupomone again. There's that word again. Because you have persevered through hard times and persecutions and difficulties and pressing pressures and you've built your character and built your hope and you've dealt with all of this, I also will keep you from the hour of trial of which you shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. The hour of trial is the seven-year tribulation. Here in the book of Revelation, Jesus is talking to his church of Philadelphia And he's telling them, because you persevered and you stood on my word and you lived your life, even when you didn't have any strength, I'm going to open a door nobody can close and you're going to miss it. I'm going to bring you up here. We see that happen in in Revelation chapter four. When a door was standing up in heaven, chapter verse one, and it says, John, come up here and let me show you what happens next. And we don't see anybody in the church up until about chapter 20. When the world sees the worst of the worst of the world, you think this is bad. It's going to be far worse. Just think when the church and the Holy Spirit, the restrainer of evil goes away, what do you think is going to happen here when people can do whatever they want? Jesus is so loving and so merciful. He says here, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Thank God we don't have to deal with that. Verse 10, 
For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Reconciliation simply means that we were brought back together. We sinned and we, our sin had made this big chasm of space because we can't be a part of that issue. We can't be a part of a, a just God. He cannot, he can't brush our sins under the rug and let him go. He can't. He's a just, he's a just God, which means our sins must be paid for. So you have your choice. Believe in Jesus Christ. It says here, Jesus Christ has brought us to this reconciliation because he died on this blood. Believe in Jesus. So we're reconciled to God because our sins are gone. We're no longer a rebellion. A re, we're not, we're not, we are no longer in rebellion. Or you can do it on your own. And you can go up and you can tell God that you are a good person and that you did everything perfectly right. And you fail to read this Bible and you fail to seek it to understand him deeper and you see you fail to see the value that the that what understanding what Jesus has done. And you can you can take the punishment that you deserve. I'm gonna close with John 16 33. And I wrote it in the amplified version because it throws a bunch of extra words in there, and that's pretty cool. But this is what it says. It says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world you have tribulation. Ah, oh, that slips us again. There's that pressing pressure again. Jesus speaking the same words we've been talking about. In the world you'll have tribulations and trials and distresses and frustrations, but be of good cheer. Take courage, be confident, certain, and undaunted. For I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of power to harm you and have conquered it for you. We need to be at peace with God. We need to be at peace with the Savior. Because all the stuff that happens is just making us better. Just making us stronger, giving us character, perseverance, character, hope, hope in a Christ that's given us the Holy Spirit. We cannot lose. We are living in eternity already, and our best is yet to come. So we're going to circle back to peace with God. See, when the mentality in hard times is important, we need to keep our mentality fixed on the things that are going on now. We need to, we need to hold tight to this because I saw things today. I don't know if they're true. There's a lot of propaganda. Now you're reading the – there was a, a, a report that came out that – Trump said something that was anti-Israel, and then we find out that it's a complete fabrication. So now you don't know if AI is involved. You don't know who's lying. You don't know where it is coming from. Get in the Bible. Seek the Bible and the truth here. That's the only place we can count on it and be ready for the end. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, thank you, Lord, for your wonderful word. It's so powerful. In a time when things are getting harder, Lord, but we have you. And I continue to think of that idea that, that you loved us so much. You poured love into our hearts, nothing we did. Through the Holy Spirit, you gave us nothing we did. But because you love us, you've given this opportunity to be reconciled back to you, to have everlasting life, Lord. I look forward, Father Maranatha, Lord Jesus, that you would come. And I can stand before you. I can look you in the eyes and hear your voice and give you a hug. Father, that day is not far away. We're grateful for this. Father, we pray a special prayer for Israel. The peace of Jerusalem, Psalm 122.6, tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, that peace for them and their companions would come upon us. You would bring us blessings. Father, I don't know what's up next, but you're moving in your time frame, doing your thing. You've told us about it. We're ready for it doesn't make it easier, Lord, but we have you to walk with us. And we know that there is no one else that can help us, take care of us, be merciful, be gracious to us. Habakkuk learned it as he's dealing with you earlier in the book when he said, Lord, I don't know what you're doing. I don't understand why you're doing it this way. And he said, just write the vision. It's going to happen. It may be delayed, but it's coming. But the just shall live by faith. Father, we're grateful. Go before us. 
Keep us safe, be our rear guard. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.